morning friends. In the previous classes, we have seen the principle of the metal casting process. We have seen that in the metal casting process, whenever we want to manufacture a particular component with a particular geometry, first we will create a similar cavity of the same geometry and we will pour the molten metal into that cavity. After some time, the molten metal solidifies, then we remove that molding medium and we get the solidified casting. This is the simple principle of the metal casting process. We have seen the different classifications of the metal casting process and also we have seen the uh, different terms used in the metal casting process. And today we will see the molding sands and design. These are the different types of the molding sands. One is the green sand, second one is the coarse sand, next one the dry sand, next one the loam sand, next one the facing sand, next one the backing sand and finally the parting sand. Most of the times uh, we hear these uh, words and uh, some people may not be able to distinguish among these uh, different uh, sands. Let us see what is the purpose of each and every sand which is mentioned here. First let us see the green sand. Green sand is also known as tempered or natural sand which is just a mixture of base sand like silica sand, zircon sand with binder and moisture. This is the green sand means when the moisture is present it is known as the green sand. It is commonly employed for the production of ferrous and also for the production of non-ferrous castings. So, this is the uh, green sand. Next one we will see the core sand. In the previous class we have seen that core means uh, yes, it is an object which is kept inside the mould cavity. If we want a casting with some hollow space inside or with hollow cavity inside, what we have to do? We will be placing a core inside the mould cavity, so that the molten metal does not occupy in that particular space. This core is made up of the core sand. This core sand used for making cores and it, al it is also known as oil sand. This is highly rich silica sand mixed with oil binders such as core oil. The core oil is composed of linseed oil, resin, light mineral oil and other binder materials. So, this is the core sand. Next we will see the dry sand. Green sand that has been dried or baked in a suitable oven after making the mould and core is known as the dry sand. Sometimes uh, if the uh, just now we have seen we have seen that if the moisture is present then we will call it as the green sand. Sometimes if the because of the presence of the moisture sometimes we get the defects like blow holes and porosity. So, to avoid these defects we dry this uh, moisture then this uh, sand is known as the dry sand. It has more strength, rigidity and thermal stability and it is mainly suitable for larger castings. So, remember that the difference between the green sand and the dry sand is green sand means almost the same composition, but it contains the moisture. Whereas, when we what say dry out the moisture, then it becomes the dry sand. Next one the loam sand. It is a mixture of sand and clay with water to a thin plastic paste. Whereas, in the case of the green sand, we mix the water, but it does not look like a paste. Of course, it becomes sticky, but it is certainly it is not a paste. But here, the sand becomes like a paste and it possesses high clay as much as 30 to 50 and moisture up to 18 percent. This much clay we do not mix with the green sand. So, this is another difference with the loam sand and shape is given to the mould by sweeps. In the case of the conventional sand moulding process, we used to ram the moulding sand. We dump the moulding sand inside the moulding boxes and with rammers we used to ram or it is done by the 
machine molding. Whereas here we do not do the ramming, but we do the molding by the sweeps means uh, there will be one sweep pattern will be there and this as we rotate this uh, sweep pattern a mold cavity is created inside this uh, loam sand. This is particularly employed for large grey iron castings. Next let us see the facing sand. It is applied as an initial coating around the pattern so that the mold cavity will have a smooth surface. We have seen that in the previous class we use a model to create the mold cavity inside the mold. Means uh, if we want to make a particular casting with a particular geometry, initially we make a pattern. This pattern will have the similar geometry as that of the final component. Most of the times this model which is technically called as the pattern has a rough texture because most of the times it is made up of the uh, wood. Because of the rough texture of the wood, even the mould surface, cavity surface will have a rough texture and as a result even the solidified casting will have a rough texture. Now we want to minimize this rough texture. So what we have we are going to do is we are applying this facing sand over the pattern. This facing sand is a fine sand then just we sprinkle on the uh, just on the pattern before we compact the molding sand. Then what happens the rough texture of the pattern is minimized and over that we put the molding sand and then we complete the ramming right. So it comes in contact with the molten metal so it must possess high refractoriness means when the molten metal of high temperature is poured into the mold this facing sand layer should not burn. So that is the important characteristic the facing sand must possess and it is made up of fine silica sand and clay without the use of the used sand. It is used only once repeatedly it cannot be used. So this is the facing sand. So facing sand is to improve the surface finish of the cavity and also to get a better surface finish on the solidified casting. Next one let us see the backing sand. Backing sand or floor sand you is used for back up the facing sand and is used to fill the whole volume of the molding flask. Now we see uh, initially we take the molding box and inside that we put the pattern and over the pattern we sprinkle the facing sand to minimize the rough texture of the pattern. Then over that we put the molding sand. That molding sand it contains the what say valuable ingredients and costly ingredients and we do not want to fill the entire flask with the costly molding sand. So for that purpose for filling up the purpose we use the backing sand. It is used right it is a used molding sand and is mainly employed for the backing purpose means uh, filling the purpose right. The backing sand becomes black in color due to addition of coal dust and burning and coming in contact with the molten metal. Say we, we use the coal dust to improve its strength that is why uh, it becomes black in color and also as we it is repeatedly used and when it comes in contact with the molten metal it becomes it burns and it becomes dark. That is why it is also known as black sand. Next one parting sand. It is applied along the parting line so that the sands in the drag and cope do not stick to each other. And uh, say we have seen that in the molding system we generally we use two molding boxes right. The lower molding box is known as the drag, the upper molding box is known as the cope and we put the pattern and uh, yes we mold the two boxes and uh, these two mold boxes uh, were right uh, there in between these two molding boxes there is a separation because uh, before pouring we have to separate these two molding boxes after molding is over then we have to withdraw the pattern and we have to withdraw the sprue pin and the razor pin. So because that is why there must be a separation when we are ramming the sand the molding sand which is rammed in the cope box should not be sticking to the sand that is molded in the drag box. So what we do? Before what say after the compaction of the drag box is over then we place the cope box over the drag box 
and before placing the molding sand into the cope box, we sprinkle little amount of parting sand on the what is a compacted sand of the drag box. Then we put the molding sand into the cope box, then we start ramming. Then what happens? The sand which is molded inside the cope box does not mix with the or does not stick with the molding sand that is molded inside the drag box. So, that is the purpose of the parting sand. It creates a separation between the cope box and the drag box. Base sand like silica sand without any binder and moisture is used as the parting sand. So, this parting sand does not contain any binder and moisture, it is a dry and clear sand. Now, uh, these are the types of the molding process, I mean the uh, sand conventional sand molding process. One is the green sand molding process, this these we have already seen in the classifications of the casting process. The second one is the dry sand molding process, the finally, the chemical sand molding process. Under the chemical sand molding process, we have the shell molding and carbon, do, uh, carbon dioxide molding and no bake molding. Among this, green sand molding is widely developed than any other molding process because of its uh, simplicity and because of its uh, economy and uh, a large castings can be produced using the green sand molding. Whereas, with the what say CO2 molding and the shell molding, it is very difficult to produce very large castings. Now, we are going to uh, what say learn more about the green sand. Remember that green sand means the molding sand which contains the moisture. Now, why green sand molding? That is the fundamental question. There, uh, there is dry sand is also there and chemical sands are also there. Why? Because first point is reasonable cost. The cost is reasonable when we use the green sand. High productivity economical and also very large castings can be made using the green sand. And this green sand, of course, when we remove the moisture, it becomes the dry sand mold. Yes, uh, again we can manufacture very large castings and easily adaptable to manual, semi-auto and automatic molding machines. Remember that this molding can be done manually and also on the semi-automatic machines and also on the fully automatic molding machines. And this green sand can be molded in all these cases, manually it can be molded, using semi-automatic machines it can be molded and using fully automatic machines also it can be used. That is why this green sand molding has become popular. Now, this is the general composition of the green sand. So, these are the ingredients, we have the base sand binder, this is also known as the clay and we mix the additives and also the water. Base sand is uh, say it is present 85 to 90 percent, binder which is also known as the clay, it is between 6 to 11 percent. Next one, we mix the additives and the proportion is 2 to 8 percent and water is 2 to 5 percent. Now, what happens? Uh, as we what say pour the molten metal, right, part of the binder becomes inactive once the temperature crosses about some 500 degrees centigrade or 600 degrees centigrade. Then it loses its binding property. Though it is physically present, it becomes inactive. So, then in such a case, that portion of the uh, binder which has lost its property but still physically present, it is termed as the dead clay. Now, what happens? First time, when, when we first time prepare the green sand and yes, we make the mold, this what is a dead clay may not be present, but this sand is repeatedly used. Yes, we pour the molten metal, the molten metal solidifies and we break the sand mold and we take the casting outside. The same sand will be remixed and it will be reused to make another mold. Then what happens? Previous time a part of the binder has lost its properties that has become the dead clay. So, dead clay becomes a component of the green sand except the first time 
second time onwards there will be dead clay in the molding sand or the green sand. So, now we will see these are the green sand components, one is the base sand, now let us see the components, base sand first one, second one the binders, binder means the clay, next one the additives, next one the water, this finally the dead clay, though dead clay we do not add intentionally the part of the binder or the active clay, once it what say comes in contact with the hot metal, it turns into dead clay and this is this becomes a component of the green sand. So, these are the 5 components of the uh, green sand. Now, we will be seeing all these components in detail. Initially, let us see the uh, base sand. What is this base sand? Commonly, these are the commonly used base, base sands. One is the silica sand, second one is the zircon sand, third one olivine sand, fourth one chromite sand, fifth one aluminum silicate sands. These are the commonly used base sands. Now, let us study these sands in detail. First, let us see the silica sand. What is this silica sand? Material used for its economic, economic advantages and sufficient thermal resistance. So, a silica sand has got the sufficient thermal resistance means it can withstand very high temperatures and it is available abundantly on the river beds and also on the sea beds. If we go in the summer uh, to the side of the river beds and we can see there a what is a clear sand on the river beds. So, this is the uh, silica sand and we can see these are the uh, silica what is a sand beds look like this. And again we can see these are the uh, silica sand beds. Now, this is the silica sand components, again silica sand has got uh, three components. One component is silicon dioxide and it is pr present up to 98 percent. Again it contains aluminum oxide, maximum it contains 0 0.13 percent and also it contains iron oxide up to 0 0.06 percent. And say this is the distribution of the silica sand and it is used for all the general applications. So, we have seen the silica sand, what is its source and what are what is its chemical composition and what are its properties and applications we have seen for the silica sand. Now, let us see for the zircon sand. Zircon is the oldest mineral available on the earth or known on the earth. It is also very hard mineral and has a very high melting point and, and the melting point is 3000 degree centigrade. It has a very high melting point. So, again we can see these are all the zircon sand lumps and beds we can see here. And this is the typical uh, chemical composition of the uh, zircon sand. The zircon sand contains the following uh, ingredients, right. So, the components, one is the zirconia, ZRO2, it, uh, it is up to 65.9 percent it contains. Next one, it also contains silicon dioxide uh, up to 32.54 percent. Next one, zircon sand also contains alumina, aluminum oxide 1.15 percent. Next one, it contains titania, titanium dioxide up to 0.27 percent and it contains ferrous oxide Fe2O3 up to 0 0.04 percent. Next one, it contains silica, uh, right, again uh, silicon dioxide, it contains point free, free silica up to 0.1 percent. This is the general form of the zircon sand. So, uh, in general, uh, it appears as the zirconium silicate, ZR SiO4. Now, what is its application? We have seen that the uh, what is a silica sand, that is the silica base sand is used for all the general applications. What is the application of the zircon sand? It is used in such application where high refractoriness is required. Maybe if we are making what say alloys or the metals with moderate or the low what say melting temperatures, no need for the zirconium sand. We can use the silica sand as the base sand. But 
if when we are pouring alloys of high temperature, high melting temperature, at such times we need a base sand of higher refractoriness and zircon sand contains the higher refractoriness. That is why where high refractoriness is required, we use the zircon sand. Next one, so we are learning about the base sands. So, we have also already seen the silica sand and the zircon sand. Now, let us see the olivine sand. Olivine sand, it is one of the most abundant minerals on the earth. Olivine is named after its olivine green color. This sand looks green in color. Olivine sand source and lumps, here we can see these are the uh, sources and lumps of the olivine sand and they look green in color. That is why it is known as the olivine sand. And here we can see a single grain of the olivine sand. You can see this is a single grain of the olivine sand uh, which looks green in color. And these are the grains of the olivine sand. We can see different size grains are there all look in green in color. And this is the typical chemical composition of the olivine sand. It contains magnesium oxide 46 to 50 percent. It contains silicon dioxide. 41 to 43 percent, it contains iron oxide 6 to 8 percent and it also contains loss on ignition up to 2 percent, maximum 2 percent. And this is the general form of the olivine sand, it, it is the general form is the magnesium iron silicate 2 Mg Fe O S I O 2. So, this is the chemical composition general chemical composition of the olivine sand. And we are seeing, uh, we are learning about the base sands and we have already seen silica sand, zircon sand and the olivine sand. Now, let us see the chromite sand. Chromite sand is a byproduct of the ferrochrome production. In the ferrochrome alloy industries, so this comes out as a byproduct. This is not a natural mineral. And what is the chemical composition? Yes, it contains the chromium oxide 46 percent minimum. Next, it contains silicon dioxide 1 percent maximum. It contains iron oxide 26 percent. It contains calcium oxide 0.15 percent and it contains aluminum oxide 15 percent. Finally, it contains magnesium oxide up to 9.8 percent. So, these are the different what say uh, elements or the different uh, components present in the chromite sand. This is the general form of the chromite sand. It appears as the iron chromium oxide FeO CrO3. So, this is the general form of the chromite sand. We have seen silica sand, zircon sand, olivine sand, chromite sand. Now, let us see the aluminum silicate sand. Aluminum silicate, right, uh, its chemical formula is Al2 SiO5 occurs in three common forms, right. One is the kyanite, next one the silimanite, next one the andalusite. These three minerals have high refractiveness and low thermal expansion. They are widely used in the precision investment casting foundries and often in combination with the zircon floor, right. So, these may not be used in the commonly used in the green sand molding, but we have seen that uh, what say under the special casting process, there is a process called investment casting process, where the pattern is made up of the wax, right. So, around the wax we give a ceramic slurry coating, repeatedly we give the ceramic slurry coating. After a shell is created, what we do? We heat the system and uh, right the wax inside the shell will be drained out, then we pour the molten metal into the shell, right. In that process, this uh, sand is used and uh, right this aluminum silicate sand in combination with the zircon sand, it is used. Now, let us see the what is a, a thermal behavior of these sands, what happens. Right. So, this is the uh, y axis is the percentage expansion and x axis is the what is a pouring temperature or the uh, temperature and 
its behavior corresponding to the temperature we can see on the y axis. Let us see the silica sand, this green colored one indicates the uh, what say silica sand's behavior, thermal behavior. Now, uh, it uh, starts expanding uh, water reasonably from 200 degrees centigrade onwards. Now, when it comes to 600 degrees centigrade, what happens? It reaches the maximum expansion and that, that expansion continues till about 1400 degrees centigrade. So, silica sand has the highest thermal expansion. Next one, let us see the zircon sand. The zircon sand, yes again it starts uh, what say expanding from right from 0 degrees and it uh, uh, what say continuously it is expanding up to 600. At about 600 degrees centigrade, it uh, what say considerably what say increases expands more and yes and this is its expansion behavior and its expansion is little lower than the expansion of the silica sand. Next one, we will see the olivine sand. This uh, pink colored one indicates the thermal behavior of the olivine sand. Now, we can see here, it is uh, it, uh, as the temperature is increasing, it's, it starts expanding. Yes, maybe at about 600, it is uh, more expanding and yes, it is continuously expanding, but certainly its expansion is lower than the expansion of silicon and zircon sands. Finally, we will see the chromate sand. Now, this uh, blue colored one line indicates the thermal behavior of the chromate sand. We can see up to almost up to 400 degree centigrade, there is no thermal expansion. It is thermally stable and maybe at about 800 degree centigrade, it will uh, what say expands uh, a little and it continues even after 1400 degree centigrade, it continues to be uh, what say uh, it contains a little expansion, it shows the little expansion. Now, when we compare all these uh, sands, silica sand, zircon sand, olivine sand and chromate sand, silica sand has the highest thermal expansion and next to that zircon sand's expansion is more and below zircon sand, olivine sand is the one which occupies below the zircon sand and remember that chromate sand has the minimum thermal expansion. It is thermally stable, but it is costly. Now, here we can also see this is the thermal behavior of the bentonite. Bentonite means it is a, uh, what is a binder. We will see, we will study about this bentonite uh, uh, after some time. Now, these are the base sand materials, right. Uh, yes, we can see here silica sand, chromate sand, zircon sand and olivine sand, right. And the formula of the silica sand is silicon dioxide SiO2 and its specific density is 2.65, right. And its bulk density is 1.6 and its sintering point is 1730 degrees centigrade and thermal conductivity low and reaction is high and utilization with almost all the metals it can be used and it is uh, what say uh, it is uh, it has got the price is low and coming to the chromate sand and its chemical formula is uh, FeO CrO3 and this is the specific density and this is the bulk density and sintering point is uh, 2095 degree centigrade and uh, thermal conductivity is high and uh, reaction with the molten metal is low and utilization it is used for the steel and manganese castings and uh, right it has got the higher price. Next one is the zircon sand and its chemical formula is ZR SiO4 and this is the specific density and bulk density and the sintering point is more than 2200 degree centigrade. A thermal conductivity is very high and uh, reaction with the molten metal low and utilization it is used for the steel castings and price is high. Next one this is the olivine sand. So, this is the chemical formula to MgFeO SiO2 and this is the specific density and this is the bulk density and the sintering point is 1857 degree centigrade. Thermal conductivity low and reaction with the molten metal low and utilization it is used for the steel castings and price is medium or the moderate. Now, we will see the binders. We have already completed the base sands and we have seen the different types of the base sands and their origin and applications and their chemical constraints we have seen. Now, let us see the binders. 
first of all the question is why we have to use the binder. Binders are added to give cohesion to the molding sands. Cohesion means ability of the molding sand particles to stick to each other that is the cohesion. So, the binders enable cohesion to the molding sands. Next one, binders provide strength to the molding sand and enable it to retain its shape and mold cavity. It also it, it, uh, it gives the cohesion property, not only that it enables uh, to gain strength and uh, retain its shape after we compact the sand. So, that is the purpose of the binder. Next one, binders should be added in optimum quantity as they reduce the refractiveness and permeability. These binders are the fine powders, right. So, there is a property called permeability for the molding sand. Permeability means ability of the molding sand to allow hot gases to pass through the neighboring sand grains like this, like this. It has to enable through the neighbor, neighboring particles. So, what happens when we add excessive of binder? It fills those uh, what is a gaps between the neighboring grains and the ability of the steam or the hot gases to escape through the neighboring grains comes down drastically. But we need it unless we add the binder, we cannot get the cohesion. Unless we add the binder, we cannot get the strength. That is why we must add the binder, but it must be optimum. Then and we have to balance the strength, the cohesion and also the permeability we have to balance. That is why we have to add the binders in an optimum quantity. These are the common binders used in the green sand. One is the bentonite, another one is the fire clay, next one illite, next one limonite, next one kaolinite. So, these are the common binders used for the green sand mixing. Now, let us see all these binders one by one. First, let us see the bentonite. What is bentonite? Most of the time, uh, this is the main clay or the main binder, important binder used in the molding sand. Many a times, people use bent, what say in the for, for the word clay, instead of using the clay or instead of using the binder, they use the word bentonite. So, it is so important and it has become very popular among all the binders. First of all, what is this bentonite? Bentonite is a type of clay whose main constituent is uh, right Montmorillonite belonging to the smectite group. And what is its chemical formula? Bentonite is an absorbent aluminum phyllosilicate consisting mostly of Montmorillonite. Here we can see word phyllo. Phyllo means thin sheets means it, uh, it is available in the form of thin lamellar sheets. That is the physical structure of the bentonite. Next one, it is a structure, bentonite has a sheet like structure, just now uh, we have seen, right. And its division, particle size is less than 2 microns. Dispersion, possibility to make colloidal suspension with more or less stability in water. Now, what is the source of bentonite? Bentonite is a relatively soft stone formed over geological time by the natural alteration of volcanic tuffs due to acid or alkyl, alkaline rain. So, uh, bentonite comes from the what is a volcanic tuffs. So, this volcanic say tufts are uh, laid underground for several years and over that we can see acid rains or alkaline rains will be there and because of that we get the bentonite and bentonite will be inside the ground and we can take it outside. That is the source of the bentonite and this is how we can get the bentonite. Initially, this is the mining, right. So, this mining uh, say uh, often we can see this bentonite mines where for, uh, there is a what say previously there was volcanic eruption, right. So, next this is the exploitation, 
right with machinery we have to take it that uh, material next one uh, this is the stocking next one it is the activation and after that there will be drying and milling finally it is the packing so this is the uh, right uh, bentonite from mining to the uh, foundry right so here we can see first stage is the mining exploration exploration next one mining exploitation next one raw um, material stocking we can see here next one activation next one drying right next one stocking and finally we can see a uh, milling right a uh, finished products to stock and packing and delivery to the foundry industries now the question is why it is called as bentonite the first industrial exploitation at the beginning of the 20th century started at a mine located near fort benton in wyoming province usa this industrial exploitation of bentonite was done in a place called fort benton in usa that's why it is known as the bentonite this explains the origin of the term bentonite which was first a trade name how does bentonite absorb moisture that is the question right so why we are adding this bentonite this bentonite is a binder or a clay why it what's a first of all it improves the cohesiveness of the molding sand it induces the strength to the molding sand right the aluminum phyllosilicate bentonite layers have a slightly negative charge that is compensated by the exchangeable ions right calcium ion or the sodium ion in the intermediate layers the charge is so weak that the cations calcium ions or the sodium ions can be adsorbed with an associated hydrate shell moisture here we can see bentonite layer structure and here we can see it is present in the form of the sheet like structure layered structure and we can see this is the sodium ion and here we can see calcium ion the space between these layers is maximum with the sodium ions how does bentonite act as a binder that is the next question and here we can see this is a sand grain this is sand grain and this is a sand grain and here we can see and uh, this is the bentonite it uh, what say acts as a bridge between the sand grain and sand grain what say it what say holds both the sand grains together by forming a bridge and same thing we can see here also so that is how it makes a bridge between the sand grains and holds them together that is how it improves the cohesiveness of the molding sand these are the types of the bentonite one is the southern bentonite and another one is the western bentonite southern bentonite is also known as calcium bentonite it is also known as non swelling bentonite and its temperature of destruction is 700 degrees centigrade coming to the western bentonite it is also known as sodium bentonite and it is also known as swelling bentonite and its temperature of destruction is 1000 degrees centigrade sometime back we have seen that uh, the clay loses its properties right uh, when it uh, comes in contact with the molten metal yes these are such temperatures say uh, southern bentonites loses its property when it is heated up to 700 degrees centigrade whereas western bentonite it loses its property when it comes in what say when its temperature crosses 1000 degrees centigrade once uh, they cross these temperatures they become the they are termed as the dead clays which bentonite to choose that is the first question we have seen that there are two types of the bentonites southern bentonite and the western bentonite which bentonite to choose calcium bentonite is better known for its ability to quickly develop green properties it offers better flow than sodium bentonite and lower uh, deformation it offers lower deformation a molding sand with calcium bentonite has better ability to flow into the deep and tight pockets around the pattern that's why the both bentonites can be blended at different ratios to achieve roughly average physical 
properties. So, we have completed the uh, bentonite. Next, we will see the uh, uh, fire clay, right. So, fire clay is the uh, next uh, what is a binder or the next clay among the binders. It is used next to the bentonite. What is this fire clay? It is usually found near the coal mines, right. The hard black lumps of fire clay are taken out and pulverized for use in the foundry. Since the size of the fire clay particles is very large, they give poor or moderate bonding strength to the foundry sand, right. So, it is used or right usually found near the coal mines. So, this is the typical appearance of the fire clay. Next one, uh, we will see the illite. Illite is found in natural molding sands that are formed by the decomposition of micaceous materials due to weathering, right. So, it is found uh, right in the natural molding sands. Illite is a phyllosilicate or layered aluminum silicate. Here also we can see the word phyllo, phyllo means layers, what is a layered and leaf like structures. Illite possesses moderate shrinkage and poor bonding strength than the bentonite. So, uh, bentonite is widely used, next to bentonite this illite is used. So, this is the typical appearance of the illite. Next let us see the limonite. Limonite is an iron ore consisting of mixture of hydrated uh, iron oxide and uh, hydroxides in varying composition, right. So, the chemical composition is FeO, OH and NH2O, right. This N varies, right. And this is the limonite ore and limonite deposit from the mine. And here we can see this is the limonite deposit. So, this limonite is another binder used for developing the strength and cohesiveness of the molding sand. Finally, we will see the kaolinite. Kaolinite is a clay mineral with the chemical composition aluminum AlO2 SiO2 O5 and in brackets it is OH4. So, this is the chemical composition of the kaolinite. Next one, it is also a layered silicate mineral like bentonite. It is also known as China clay and this is the what is the typical mine of the kaolin and here we can see this is all the kaolin. Friends, uh, uh, till now we are learning about the molding sands and we have seen the, uh, the molding sand ingredients, right. The base sand, the binder, the additives, the moisture, the dead clay we have seen and among these we have covered so far the base sands and the binders. We will continue the remaining ingredients in the next lecture. Thank you.